It's presidential, the outcome evident. So we strive for welcome, 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 family. You already know what it is, right? Three, remember, repeat. The Lavis, the, the Lavis Reading Show. I don't know why I keep getting this message. The Lavis Reading Show on the planet. Not just the planet, the city, but the world. You know what I mean? Um, Y'all know what we're doing, right? This is this is basically a segment where we're giving out positivity. And um, I could be giving out some negative stuff right now. I could be telling y'all what's going on on Instagram. But instead, we're going to put what's, what we want on Instagram you know what I mean? A little positivity. So let's go. After that, I hooked up with the production duo, the Trackmasters. And through them was able to land a real deal with Columbia Records. I recorded a bunch of songs for my debut album, but then things stalled. More on that shortly. Before the album could come out, I got shot. As the rumors began to spread about what was behind the shooting, Columbia panicked and dropped me. At that point, I was almost 25 years old. Very young for a teacher, doctor, or lawyer, but not so young in a youth-orientated culture like hip-hop. Worse, I was perceived as damaged goods on top of being shot. I'd already forced my way out of one deal and been dropped by a major label. Most people in the industry didn't think I was worth the headache. A lot of rappers in my situation would have felt very uneasy. They would have worried that their dream was about to slip out of their reach. Racked by anxiety and confusion, if a label, any label, offered them a deal, they probably would have signed it that day. And yet, that wasn't my mentality. I didn't care about what had already happened to me. I wasn't signing anything unless I was sure it was the best deal for me. In that moment and going forward, my past wasn't going to cloud my vision for the future. The first deal I got offered was from Universal. They said they wanted me. But when I had a lawyer review their contract, I learned the actual deal they were offering was a joint venture with $1.3 million for a solo album and a G-Unit project. I saw it for what it was, a way for them to work with me while hedging their bets. I wasn't looking to partner with anyone who wasn't prepared to go all in with me. I passed on Def Jam. Then a guy named 3H from Capitol Records reached out. He flew me out to LA, my first trip to the West Coast. When I got there, I was surprised to see that he was this little white kid. It seemed crazy to me that he already had so much juice, but I thought it was ill that he'd already maneuvered himself into a position of power. He was angry and cocky. No, he was hungry and cocky, not unlike myself. I was very tempted to work with him. Then his boss at Capitol got cold feet. He told 3H I was too scary and that he didn't want bodyguards at his house. He wasn't incorrect. There was a menacing aura around me at the time, and bodyguards followed along everywhere I went. Still, I wasn't going to try to convince someone who couldn't see my value as much as I liked 3H. I knew that capital wasn't the right situation either. At the time, I was represented by Violator. Chris was my manager and someone I learned on for advice, someone I leaned on for advice. He supported me when I didn't take those deals, but I could tell it wasn't easy for him. Chris had to worry if I was ever going to give him a return on his investment in me. Yes, I had the streets buzzing through my mixtapes, but I had a lot of baggage too. The safe move would have been to take one of those deals and finally get my debut album out. Things got even more complicated when Todd Moskowitz, who was working with Chris at Violator, lined up a deal for me with J Records. Todd said it was the perfect situation. It'd be working with the industry legend, Clive Davis, which would calm a lot of folks' fears about me. Todd pushed hard for me to sign with J Records. At almost the same time Todd was making his push, I got word that Eminem was interested in signing me to Shady Records. His imprint on Interscope. I knew right away that that was the right situation. The Marshall Mathis LP had just sold $22 million. M was the reason so many white fans were embracing hip hop culture. It was the type of association you might get access to only in a lifetime, if you're fortunate. I was faced with a difficult decision. Today, people believe I would have succeeded no matter what label I signed with. Go into chat rooms and message boards and you'll even see fans claiming things like, 50 was so hot back then, he could have signed with Koch and still sold all them records. Yeah, I was hot, but even if my ego would like to believe otherwise, my career wouldn't have 
had anywhere near the same trajectory I had I signed anywhere other than Interscope. Not Koch, not Def Jam, not J Records. It wasn't just Eminem's presence either. Interscope gave me access to Dr. Dre, one of the greatest producers of all time. There was no other I, there was no other deal out there that could have matched the power of that tag team. I knew I had been groomed for the moment by all my other failures and misses. When that door opened, even just a crack, no one had to tell me twice to walk through it. Before I could take the step through Todd Moskowitz, had to get out of the way. The J Records deal would mean money for Violator. The Eminem deal wouldn't. Todd refused to let it go. So some of my crew and I had to go to Violator to discuss the situation. Todd came on very aggressively, explaining that we were contractually obligated to sign his deal. I looked to Chris for help, but he shrugged his shoulders like there was nothing he could do. He was caught between what was best for his artists and what Todd thought was best for the company. It was a surreal situation. Listening to this guy in a sports jacket and dress shoes trying to convince me I should pass up the opportunity of a lifetime to sign what I knew was a lesser deal. What Todd was saying didn't sit right with me or my people. We expressed our concerns. We might even have been a little aggressive in articulating them. At one point, I remember Todd running out of his office and down the stairs toward the street. His dress shoes clicking and clacking on the steps the whole way down. Suffice it to say, that was the last of any talk about my signing to J Records. Interscope would be my new home. We all know how the deal turned out. It made me one of the biggest stars in the history of hip hop. But I have to stress this again. At the time, it was not a clear cut decision. It was harder to tell Violator no. I didn't give a rat's ass about what Todd Moskowitz wanted, but Chris was a good friend. Passing on Jay Records put him in a tough spot. He stuck with me when a lot of other folks had abandoned me. He kept it real when others had blown smoke on my ass. It would have been a lot easier to just sign the Jay Records deal, get a good check, and make everyone happy. It would have been a compromise, but one a lot of people could have lived with. Not me. You cannot under any circumstances compromise when it's your vision on the line. You have to be prepared to go against popular opinion and turn down money, even if it jeopardizes your relationships until you're confident you're, you, you found the right opportunity. Would you marry a man just because he proposed or a woman because your friends think she's great? I hope not. You don't make a commitment like that just because someone else wants you to. I don't care if you're single, 37 years old, and every time you talk to your mother, the first thing out of her mouth is, when you giving me a grandchild, you wait until you're 100% sure he's Mr. Right before you're even thinking about saying yes. Would you put on an offer on a house because the agent you're working with is getting tired of showing you around and just wants his commission? Hell no. You get another agent and go to open house after open house until you finally find a home you can afford and that you're excited to spend the rest of your life in. When you settle... You're demonstrating a lack of confidence. If your journey hasn't been easy, you might start to question the value of what you're doing. Maybe you better grab the next thing that gets offered before you even get offered anything again. When you begin thinking like that, you've lost the hustler spirit. I was recently talking to a friend who was struggling to find that confidence. He started a business from the ground up and poured his heart and soul into it. After years of hard work, he found success and bigger companies started making offers. He looked at where his industry was headed and decided it was the right time to sell. He entered negotiations with one company and spent months and months going over the terms of the deal. He spent tens of thousands of dollars on lawyers. Then just before he was about to sign on the dotted line, the other company pulled out. The deal was dead. My friend was stunned. It seriously messed him up. He'd already started thinking about that dream house he would buy with the proceeds. Vacations he'd take his kids on. He'd seen all those zeros in his bank account, and now they were gone. He was depressed. He felt like he'd spent so much time and money for nothing. The idea of starting new negotiations gave him anxiety. He told his lawyers to find the quickest deal they could. He wasn't worried about, about fit. He wasn't worried about long-term potential. He just wanted to get something done. He lost confidence in his value. Family... Gang, 
we're gonna leave that right there, right? That's page 94. We just got through three pages. Read, remember, repeat. The lobby's being shown on the planet. Let's go.